In this video, we'll discuss the statistical tool of hypothesis testing. We have a couple of variations, but for this particular video, we'll focus on hypothesis testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is actually mean. Now, hypothesis testing involves making a claim about a population parameter and then setting about to find the evidence to support the claim. It's sort of similar to in a court case when the prosecution makes the claim about a defendant. The prosecution is claiming that the defendant is guilty and the prosecution has to go ahead and find evidence to support that claim. So hypothesis testing is an application of what we call statistical inference, which means that we analyze data and we draw conclusions about a population. And it is fairly widespread. Um, we could do it in healthcare, we could do it in agriculture, we could do it in education, in business. So you would find opportunities to do hypothesis testing in many, many places. And it is a very significant part of any statistics course. You will find that, in fact, um, of a typical undergraduate course in statistics, hypothesis testing is about almost 60% of the that you will cover. Now, what we do is we usually state two hypotheses, one which we call the null hypothesis and the other one the research hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. So, the null hypothesis is usually what you consider is the status quo. That's what we will see. Let's assume that that is true. So, if we wanted to test, for example, that... Uh, the average price of a product has changed uh, compared to historical values. But we'll say, well, let us assume it has not changed. And so that would be your null hypothesis. Let's assume the product has not changed, the average price has not changed. Now let us find evidence, because I'm making a claim that it has changed, that the average price has changed. Okay? Um, so we could probably be testing the average price of gasoline. Um, historically, the average price of gasoline has been a dollar twenty per liter, and uh, we want, we are now we now believe that it's no longer a dollar twenty. It's now different. It could be less than a dollar twenty. It could be more than a dollar twenty. So I'll assume it is a dollar twenty, but try to find evidence that it is not a dollar twenty. That kind of approach actually we refer to as proof by contradiction. So we'll pretend that it is a dollar twenty. But we'll actually try to contradict that by finding evidence that speaks to the contrary. So we do use symbols. Um, for the null hypothesis, we usually denote that by HO. And then the alternative hypothesis by HA. Some books use H1. It's like H0 and H1. Uh, I'll be using HA. So in formulating the hypothesis, of hypotheses, because we have two of them, um, we have the status quo, we have the research hypothesis. So here's an example. The box of cereal has a mean fill of 16 ounces. So we'll say, all right, but let's try to find evidence that it doesn't have a mean of 16 ounces. So we will take our null hypothesis or our status quo to be that the mean is equal to 16. And then our research hypothesis, we will say the mean is not equal to 16. If we wanted to test a research hypothesis, um, so here's a case where we believe that Goodyear's tire, Goodyear's tire will last longer than its competitors or it will last more than an average of 60,000 miles. So that's what we want to prove, which is here. So we will say, let us assume that it does not last more than 60,000 miles. In that case, we will say, as our null hypothesis, it lasts 60,000 or less. But now we will try to find evidence that it lasts 60,000. Notice that the equal sign is always in the null hypothesis. It's always in the null hypothesis. Never in the alternate hypothesis. And I'll tell you why shortly. And here's another case. 
we want to claim, we are claiming that the average wait time in a medical clinic is less than 15 minutes. So here's a meal less than 15 minutes. So what we will assume is true is that the meal is not less than 15 minutes, which is the opposite, which means it is greater than or equal to 15. That is what our null hypothesis would be, but our research hypothesis would be the mean is less than 15. And we'll try to find evidence uh, for that. It's uh, very important to connect the way in which your hypothesis is stated to how you will find evidence with the decision rule. So, for example, in the first case here where I'm testing the status quo, that the mean is 16 versus the mean is not 16, if I want to reject the status quo, I should try to find sample means that are much larger than 16 or much smaller than 16. And we will refer to that as a two-tailed test. Let me just see what I mean here. So, if we believe, we start off with the, this value, that the mean is 16. But I'm really trying to find evidence that it is not 16. Well, where would, where would I look for that evidence? I would look for that evidence not close to the 16, but as far away from the 16 as possible. So, the, if I could get sample means that are far away from 16, like 18, 20, 25, then I, I'm, I have evidence that it's not 16. But also, if I could find sample means that are also much smaller than 16, like 5, 10, 12, those kinds of values would be um, evidence as well. So we're saying the mean is 16, which is our HO, versus the mean is not 16, HA. So we refer to that as a two-tailed test. And the reason why we call it a two-tailed test is because we will search for evidence in both of the tails. Here's another one. Let's look at the second case where we wanted to look at the Goodyear tire. So we'll say it is a, the mean is 60,000 miles. But now we want evidence that it is greater than 60,000 miles because we're claiming that Goodyear tires last longer than others. So we believe it actually lasts longer than 60,000 miles. So we're not going to look for evidence like 40,000 and 30,000. That means it's lasting less than those. We want evidence that it's lasting more. So more means 65,000, 70,000, 80,000, which would bring us to the right of the 60,000. And so our evidence that would support our research hypothesis is in the right tail. So HO mu is less than 60,000. That's what we will assume is true, but that's not what we want to prove. But HA, the mean is greater than 60,000. Always remember that the equal sign must always be in the null hypothesis. So that we will refer to as a one-tailed test, but because it is in the right tail, we often just call it a right-tailed test. Okay? And then the last one that we looked at was that the mean wait time was less than 15, or the mean was less than 15. So what we say is, let's assume the mean is 15. But we want evidence that the mean is less than 15. So I'm not looking for 18, 19, 20 to support me. I'm looking for values that are less than 15, like 5, 8, 11. So that means I am looking down here. So that's a one-tailed test as well. And HO, HA. So the mean is greater than or equal to 15. That's what would be our null hypothesis. But our research hypothesis is that we want evidence that the mean is less than 15. Now, 
the size of the rejection regions are important because we want to decide when the sample evidence is extreme enough um, uh, or when would we consider that sample a significant sample. So we give you a term called a significance level. And significance level is a probability. So it is a probability that we would observe that sample evidence if the null hypothesis was true. And if that probability is very small, then it is significant. And, and so it is statistically significant. But the question is, how small is small? So we tell you by giving you a value of alpha, the significance level. So the size of the rejection regions, which is where we will conclude that the sample is significant, must be equal to alpha. In the two-tailed test, because the total area is alpha, then each one of them will be alpha over 2. Alpha over 2. All right? The tails. In this case, where we have a single uh, tail test or one tail test, then the entire area would be equal to alpha. The entire area is alpha. And what do we use these values for? We could determine, knowing what the size of that, those areas are, we could determine the, what we call the critical Z values. And that critical Z value is just the value at which point we know that if the Z value associated with our sample goes beyond that value, then we will consider that sample an outlier or we'll consider it a significant sample. Okay? It's very important that we get this concept because the heart of a hypothesis test is making a decision. We give you a, uh, a structured process for making a decision, but it rests with making sure that you find that your, your correct conclusion will depend on your ability to specify uh, to, uh, the um, rejection region appropriately. So one of the things that one has to do to really get this is to really practice um, doing this for one tail test and two tail tests, right tail and left tail, as many times as possible so that we could get that idea of how we set up the rejection region. Because if you can't set up the rejection region, you cannot draw a conclusion. It's very, very important. So here are the steps in formulating the null and alternate hypothesis. Step one, the population parameter of interest must be identified. So is it um, the mean? Is it a proportion? Is it the standard deviation? What are we hypothesizing about? Then the hypothesis of interest to the researcher or the analyst must be identified. So we may want to prove that the mean is no longer a particular value. That means it has changed. Or that the mean is greater than a particular value or less than a particular value. So the null hypothesis will always contain the equal sign. And that's because when we want to test the strength of the sample evidence, we need uh, our, our standard normal, if that's what we're using in this case, uh, to have a, a mean or our normal distribution, which is the distribution of the sampling, which is the sampling distribution of the sample mean, needs to have a value for the mean, first, so that we can calculate the probability. It gets that value from the null hypothesis. So we'll say, well, let the mean equal 60,000, or let the mean be equal to um, 15. So that actually is necessary, so that now we could calculate what's the probability of um, finding the sample evidence that we did. We re another t way we refer to that is what we call um, a boundary test. We're testing at the boundary. So in the null hypothesis, if we say mu is greater than or equal to, um, sorry, mu is less than or equal to, we say mu is less than or equal to 60,000 as our null hypothesis. Well, it could be 50,000, 30,000, 20. But what we will do is in our distribution, we will set the mean to 60,000. 
So that's a boundary value. You see, 60,000 is the boundary because you have other values that are also plausible, like uh, 50,000 and so on. But because we're going to set it to 60,000, we're setting it to the upper limit. And we often refer to that process of setting the null hypothesis, I mean, or setting the mean or the parameter based on the null hypothesis. We set it to the boundary value. So when we are making our conclusion, there are some possible errors that we can make. There's a type 1 error, there's a type 2 error, or there's no error. So we could possibly get it right. But the error that we can control is type 1 error. It's rejecting the null hypothesis when it is in fact true. And then what happens is that if we don't reject the null hypothesis, then the kind of error that we could commit is called type 2 error. Failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. So when you reject HL, so notice that rejecting the null hypothesis, whenever you reject the null hypothesis, you either you did it right, or you could probably commit type 1 error. But when you do not reject the null hypothesis, maybe you did the right thing, or you committed type 2 error. Okay? And this table right here helps us to see it. And uh, you may recall, let's see, if we think about the court case, then the null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent versus guilty. And if the conclusion is that the person is innocent, he is guilty. So if uh, we conclude that they're innocent and the person is innocent, that's a correct decision. But if we conclude that they're innocent, that means that we are failing to reject the null hypothesis, right? Because remember, the null is that they're innocent. Then we could possibly commit type 2 error. If we reject the null hypothesis, that means that we conclude that the person is guilty, but they actually were innocent. So whenever you reject the null hypothesis, the only error you could commit is type 1 error. But, or you could have made the correct decision. The person was actually guilty. So we have to just keep those errors in mind. When you reject the null hypothesis, you could commit type 1. When you fail to reject, you could commit type 2 error. And just kind of um, go over this over and over and over again in your head. And eventually it will stick. So let's take a look at the setting up, the setting up of the rejection region. Um, to set up the rejection region, you need to know what the significance level is. In other words, you need to have a sense of at what point do we consider a sample significant? Or at what point do we consider the probability of observing a sample as, um, as being small? Now, if it is a one-tail test that we're doing, Remember, the entire rejection region is in one tail. So here's a case where the entire rejection region is in one tail. So this is a case where we're probably looking for evidence that uh, H, H A, that the mean is greater than 25. So we'll set the mean to 25 and then look for evidence that it's greater. So that's why we're looking at the right tail. So because the significance level, alpha, we refer to it as, it is the maximum allowable probability of committing type 1 error. When can we commit type 1 error? Only when we reject the null hypothesis. So if you want to limit your risk of type 1 error to alpha 5%, as an example, then you must make the size of the rejection region alpha or 5%. If we want to limit it to 10%, we would make the size of the rejection region 10% of the population. So the size of that rejection region will depend on the value of alpha, or in other words, the maximum amount of risk that you're willing to take in committing type 1 error. So think about it. The area alpha is the rejection region. To commit type 1 error, you must first reject. So the size of the rejection region will be directly related to the risk of committing type 1 error. If I make the size of the rejection region very small, my chances of committing type 1 error will be very small. 
if I made the rejection region very large, the chances of me committing type 1 error will be very large. So alpha is what dictates the risk of type 1 error. And um, so keep that in mind. If we're talking about a two-tailed test now, if we're talking about a two-tailed test, it's the same situation where if the evidence can be found in both tails, then we divide the alpha between the two tails, alpha and two, because we're looking for evidence in both of the tails. All right? And this is a two-tailed test. And um, what we can then do is in both of these situations, determine the z-value associated with those areas. We know how to do that now. So this is minus z-alpha over 2. This is plus z-alpha over 2. And we refer to those values as critical z-values. The reason why they're critical is that beyond those z-values, either beyond in this direction or beyond in that direction, we will conclude that our sample is significant. In other words, it's an outlier. It, it, it no longer looks like the population uh, mean. And so then we have evidence that the status quo or HO should be rejected. All right? So these are critical points. These are points of demarcation. And uh, in the case of a one-tailed test, if it is a right-tailed test, then we'll use Z-alpha. If it is a left-tailed test, we'll use minus Z-alpha. Why? Because the area... So here's alpha. So this would be minus z alpha. And then if it's a right tail test, this is alpha. And therefore this would be z alpha. All right? This is how we would um, do that. So those would be our critical values, the z alphas, or z alpha on two. So just to recap that very quickly, the significance level and the critical value, the value of alpha is determined based on the cost involved in committing a type 1 error. So if it is very expensive, for example, to send an innocent person to jail, you want to make it very difficult to, set, to make that mistake. So you'll try to reduce type 1 error, the risk of type 1 error as much as possible. So you use a small alpha. The probability of making type 2 error, we refer to it as beta. And the critical value is the value corresponding to a significance level. So I just showed you here that Z critical corresponds to either Z alpha on two if it is a two-tailed test, or Z alpha if it is a one-tailed test. And the sign of the critical value will depend on whether or not we're looking in the right tail. So the sign of the Z value will be positive, or if we're looking in the left tail, the sign of the Z would be negative. Okay? So that value corresponds to a significant level that determine those test statistics, those Z values that lead to rejecting the null hypothesis and those that lead to rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay? So here is a summary of the decision rules and test statistics. So we have a couple of approaches. One approach that we could use is calculate the Z value from the sample and then compare it to the critical value, either Z alpha or Z alpha on two. Or we could calculate the p-value. So this is one approach right here. Or the p-value, which is to say, take the sample statistic, the Z value from the sample, calculate the probability associated with that and compare it to our, to our, um, our significance level. And the reason why that makes sense is that, remember, the significance level alpha is the maximum amount of risk we're willing to take. Now, if we calculate the probability associated with a sample, let's say, for example, the maximum amount of risk we're willing to take is 10%. But we've calculated a, a probability associated with a sample as being 2%. What happens is that that probability of 2% would be the actual risk that you would take in committing type 1 error if you rejected the null hypothesis. That 2% is actually much less than the 10% maximum that we set for ourselves. 
So then we would go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. We refer to that as a p-value approach. Let's see why that makes sense, okay? So let's assume that we were doing a test. And we want an alpha of 10%. Alpha, 0 0.10. So this is the size of our rejection region. We're going to test some alternate hypothesis that the mean is greater than, say, um, 15 or something. That's just... And then we have our, our um, standard normal. So if this is 10%, this is... 40%. The Z critical value in this case for 40% is 1.28. I happen to know it off the top of my head. So this is 1.28. So if we actually calculated a Z statistic, X bar minus mu, sigma over the square root of N, what if that was, say, 1.96, just for the sake of argument? So you could see here, that 1.96 would be greater than 1.28. So it would be somewhere here. 1.96, 0.96. That would be this little red section right here. Okay? So that value, we will call it a p-value. The p-value in this case is just the probability that z is greater than 1.96. And it turns out that that is 0 0.025. I happen to know that as well off the top of my head. So let's take a look at uh, two approaches to this. One is to compare the, the z values. So this is the critical value based on a significance level of 10%. And it is 1.28. Notice now that the sample statistic of 1.96 falls into the rejection region. Uh, it is beyond the 1.28, so therefore it is more of an outlier. It is an outlier. It is extreme. That sample is extreme. We've set the bar at 1.28, and now we're seeing 1.96. So we would reject the null hypothesis. We would say this sample is too way out there for the mean to still be 15. In other words, our null hypothesis would have had to have been that the mean is 15 or less. And we're saying if the mean is 15, um, we would not have a very high probability of seeing that sort of sample. All right? So that sample is significant because the chances of it occurring is small if the mean is 15, but we actually observe that sample. That's why I usually use the O here to say observe. Okay? So that's one way to compare. But then if we said, let's go one step further and convert the observed Z value to a probability. What's the chance? What's the probability associated with that? So it would be that little red region. Uh, I know 1.96, the area between the 0 and the Z is 0.475. Therefore, the balance is 0 0.025. So look at this 0 0.025. Notice that that value, which we call the p-value, is actually smaller than alpha, which is 10%. It is smaller than 10%. All right? So it is smaller than 0 0.10. So because it is smaller than 0 0.10, it means that we would actually be taking less risk than the limit that we set for ourselves. Let's look at it. If we were to take that alpha value and bring it down to 2.5%, to two we would reject the null hypothesis. So in other words, we could actually reduce the amount of risk of type 1 error down to 2.5% and still reject the null hypothesis. So another term for the p-value, which is a term I prefer, is the observed risk. That's the p-value. When you call it the observed risk, it actually helps you. It makes a bit more sense. Because what you're saying is the observed risk is 2.5%. The limit of the risk that you want me to take is 10%. So since my observed risk is less than the limit that you set for me, I will go ahead and reject the null hypothesis because I'm actually taking less risk than 
So I hope uh, we get that point. So we calculate the observed risk or p-value, and that observed risk, if it is less than the significance level, which is the limit that we set for ourselves, then we're good to go. We could reject the null hypothesis. But of course, we could commit type 1 error. But this time, our risk of type 1 error is not the alpha, alpha value of 10%. The 10% is just the maximum that we set for ourselves. The actual risk that we will take is the observed risk, which is really 2.5%. So it's even smaller, and we have a lot more confidence in our decision in that situation. So here are just a couple more things to close out this video. The test statistic when the population standard deviation is known is this z is equal to x bar minus mu sigma over root n. And um, the reason why we're using z, of course, the first limit theorem, and whenever sigma is known, or if the population is normal, the sampling distribution is always normal. All right? So this is a case where we know sigma, our sampling distribution of the sample mean will be approximate, will be normal. And so we use z. One tail test, the entire rejection in the region is, uh, occurs in one tail. In two tails, it, uh, it has to be split between the two tails. Okay. Types of hypotheses, just to recap that, as you could see, a two tail test, the, in the research hypothesis, we are just trying to prove that the parameter is not equal to the base value that we set. So in the case here, we'll see the status quo is that the mean is C, but then we want to prove that it's not C. If it is not C, then either the, the actual mean is much larger than C or much smaller than C, and hence we have alpha over 2, alpha over 2, alpha over 2. In the case of a one-tail test, so here's a, an example where we say the mean is greater than some value C. That's the null, greater than or equal to, but we want to prove that it's actually less. So if we want to prove that it's less, we would look in the left tail of the distribution. And then in this case right here, we want to prove that the mean is greater than some value C. So we look for positive large values um, of Z. And then we would be looking at the right tail. And notice the size is alpha. Size here is alpha, alpha, but alpha over 2, alpha over 2 for a two-tailed test. If you keep those things in mind, it certainly will help you to get the rejection region correct and make the right. So to just to finalize, step one, we specify the population parameter of interest. Step two. We formulate the null hypothesis and the alternative or research hypothesis about the population mean. Then we specify the desired level of significance alpha. Construct the rejection region where we would use, typically we would use the case where we find a, Z, a critical value. That critical value would be either Z or T depending on the sampling distribution. In the case when sigma is known, the sampling distribution is normal. We compute the test statistic, which is our observed value, z or x bar, but we're not doing the case where we're using a critical x bar and can't compute an x bar. We're actually just going to use the case where we compute the z values, the critical z value and the observed z value. Then we compare those two values and we reach a conclusion. We go one step further and ask ourselves, what is the probability associated with this test statistic and then we can compare that uh, probability. That probability is the observed risk of committing type 1 error. And if our observed risk is less than the limit that we set for ourselves, which is the p-value is less than alpha, we actually reject the null hypothesis as well. So we draw a conclusion regarding the null and uh, actually, we make a decision. I would. Uh, we make a decision regarding the null. So I wouldn't say draw a conclusion. I'd say make a decision regarding the null hypothesis. But then we draw a conclusion. A conclusion about.
the alternative hypothesis. Okay? So really, because what you set out to prove is about the, null, about the alternate hypothesis. That's what you really want to prove. So by rejecting the null, that's a decision. You're concluding that you have support for the alternative hypothesis. So I, this is just a, it might sound like semantics, but it is the proper way to say it. I make a decision. Am I going to reject or not reject the null hypothesis? I will reject the null hypothesis. Then my conclusion is I have evidence to support the alternative. If I'm not going to reject that, my decision is not to reject the null hypothesis, I cannot conclude, or sorry, or I will conclude that I have insufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Thank you.